Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Luis Figueroa, and uh, representing the Future Forum board here. On uh, behalf of the Future Forum, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to start with a few thank yous to our sponsors, the Downtown Alliance and FVF Law. Um, the Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and our sponsors. And I'd also like to thank the LBJ staff, um, and especially Sarah McCracken, for her work to put these events together at this beautiful venue um, and historic venue, the LBJ Library. Uh, for those that may not be as familiar, the Future Forum brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of views to discuss local, state, national, and even international topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create informed, bipartisan discussions, and I hope you'll join as a member to help support the work and elevate discourse in policy and politics today. Uh, with, so for today, speaking of, we're at the election only 19 days away. We wanted to explore an issue that has been featured in news over the recent months. There are rumblings of a political shift in the Rio Grande Valley following the 2020 elections. And we're honored to be joined today by three guests to discuss the evolving politics, the complex electorate, and the factors driving change in South Texas. So first, um, we have Cecilia Bailly, is a writer, journalist, anthropologist, and founder of Culture Concepts, a consultancy focused on ethnographic research, cultural analysis, and storytelling. She has conducted research and written stories about Latinos in the U.S.-Mexican border for over 20 years, and she's been a writer at large at the Texas Monthly since 2000, and has been published in numerous other media athlete, um, outlets, including Harper's Magazine, The New York Times, and The San Antonio Express News. Also joining us is Dr. Sergio Garcia Rios, an associate director for research the center at the Center for, I'm sorry, associate director for research the Center for Study, Race, and Democracy at UT Austin, right here. His research investigates the formation and transformation of Latino identities and the political implications of these transformations. He has also served as the Director of Polling and Data at Univision News. Moderating today's discussion is, is my friend Steve Taylor. He's Editor-in-Chief of the Rio Grande Guardian, which has been placed for 17 years. And I highly recommend anyone interested in following the news and happenings in South Texas um, to subscribe and, and look into the Rio Grande Guardian. Please keep in mind that there will be some time for questions at the end of the panel, and I will now turn it over to Steve to moderate our discussion. Thank you all very much. And uh, th I'd like to just say thank you to the uh, Future Forum for inviting us to today, and I'm looking forward to this conversation with Cecilia and Sergio. Um, I was. We, we were thinking we would probably have one more guest here, but that, that, unfortunately that didn't happen. So what I did, um, I tried to be, you know, try to get a lot of opinions uh, before coming up here from some people I have respect for across the political spectrum as to what their uh, analysis was and got a range of views. So uh, this, we could speak for hours and hours on this, I know. So I just, there's a few of them though I'd like to, um, um, explain, uh, mention their responses or give those responses before asking the questions. And so um, uh, one businessman I know said, Valley Hispanics do not pay much attention to labels. They rather vote on what they hear and what they believe. One example being the mayor of McAllen. He's a registered Republican. He won in a very democratic area. Another is the mayor of Donna who's been winning that city for many years. He's a Republican. So the point there is that we've always had Republicans in, in uh, elective office, but obviously at the city level, the party labels are not there. Another example is the Democratic candidate now for State District 27, um, Morgan Lamentia. She's running as a Democrat, but she, will, uh, she, she comes across as being very pro-business and um, and many Republicans like this person will, will, will vote for her. So um, is this guy right? I mean, I, 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 the, 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 there's always been, you know, it's, uh, there's certainly not yeah. a lot of progressives there. I mean, one candidate today put out, yeah. sent me a press release saying she's got the endorsement of uh, Bernie Sanders. And I'm thinking, well, is that a death wish? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, I don't know who wants to go first on that. I, 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 I can say something about that. Um, uh, and, and, and really, uh, this is a, a fascinating statement. I, uh, I'm particularly 
uh, interested in how this person says, um, we don't pay much attention to labels. Um, uh, I think that's partially true, uh, but only partially. Uh, I think at the end of the day, and as someone who studies identities, um, our identities are important. And I think um, what he might really be wanting to say is that we haven't really felt attached to either party. In that case, mm -hmm. I think they're right. Um, Latinos traditionally have voted Democratic, and there's always been that 20 to 30 percent that Latinos have voted for, not only in the uh, River and the Valley area, which historically has shown these percentages, but also at the national level. And it seems like now people have forgotten how uh, much of a support Bernie, Sa uh, not Bernie Sanders, but um, uh, Bush, uh, George Bush, had uh, from Latinos. Uh, you know, the, he was really the first few uh, Bush, right? But then, uh, if I if I can use the same uh, image of the TO pol political science uh, po po politician, that translates to Bernie Sanders, who was actually the the the, the second round of the TO, the TO Bernie. Um, and who was the favorite candidate in the primaries among Democrats. And so what I think is that Latinos have always had a hard time identifying uh, with this sorting of the party that most other groups uh, sort of easily uh, align with. What uh, Latinos uh, generally are more drawn to is to things that, they, uh, that matter in the day to day. And, and today it so happens that one thing that Latinos really are thinking about, surprise, surprise, is the economy. Is the economy. Is prices, is the inflation, right? And yes, two, three years ago, it was healthcare. It was the price of healthcare, and with the coronavirus, healthcare in general. So Bernie Sanders was the favorite candidate. And so I think, I think there's a lot of truth in this statement, and a lot we can learn from this short um, statement that you uh, uh, shared with us, because we can learn that this is, in a way, the story of Latinos in, uh, as, as, as they become more and more political. But then there's certainly a demographic shift. And hopefully we can engage more with this other part of the demographic shift. Um, but I think it's true, only partially. <laughs> Cecilia. Yeah, what I would say is that the Rio Grande Valley is, has very specific um, context and factors going on. But it's also, in some ways, a little bit of a kind of microcosm or reflection of the bigger reality across the country. So the thing that I find very specific to that context, the local context, is that it was dominated by Democratic um, elected officials for generations. And so what I found in, in my research down there is that um, the parties didn't debate ideas or policy positions. It was always the Democrats that would win. And so candidates ran more on name um, and Republicans ran as Democrats. Um, and so I think that is what's shifting. And in 10 people that I interviewed in Brownsville, eight of them uh, compared local elections to high school elections where it's about the most popular person winning and all you see is the billboards with the names, but we don't really know what they stand for. And so I think what you're seeing down there is like now this is requiring people to actually at least begin debating issues. And so those identities are, are being kind of sorted out again. And then that may happen again down the road. The thing that is a reflection, I think, of a national, uh, not trend, but reality, is as Sergio was saying, um, what we found in Texas statewide through a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews is that partisanship is fairly low among a lot of Latinos. I wouldn't say all of them. And by partisanship, I mean like an ironclad commitment to the party's platform. So if the party supports this, then I will support this for this election. Um, what you find instead more is for different levels, there's low levels of partisanship. One is, you know, you have fairly new voters. A lot of Latinos haven't, their families haven't been voting for a certain party over generations. Another is that the parties haven't engaged Latinos on either side directly. And the third is there are other people whose views are sort of fall on multiple spots of the political spectrum. It's not just that they're all moderate. They could have a very progressive position on one thing and fairly conservative on another. So I think all of those things are at play in that one statement. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> it's a rather a broad one to start with. Um, let me, I would like to ask, how many in the audience are from the Valley or from the Radio South Texas? Excellent. There's two or three here. That's good. Maybe in the Q&A we could 
um, yeah, we can uh, have that have, have a conversation. And uh, I, I'm asked that because the many people will not be aware that they, they might think it's just a dusty border town. You know, that's the mm -hmm. valley. It's just not that today. We've got two big metropolitan areas uh, in Brownsville and the McAllen Mission Edinburgh area. And uh, population, if everyone was counted, is probably two million people now. So it's become more sophisticated. Um, and um, you know, the, after the set, um, my question would be: after the second and third generation, the second or third, maybe the third or fourth generation, are not so tied to the struggles of the parents and the grandparents, which uh, who, like you say, they used to always vote Democrat, and now there's perhaps um, a, a detachment from those struggles and. Yeah. And therefore, they're more open yeah. to, to other ideas. And, 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 yeah, that's precisely the demographic change that I was talking about. We're, we're seeing, certainly in the Rio Grande Valley area and, and perhaps across the uh, country, is that um, the chair of second, third, and even fourth generation is much larger than that of fir first, second generation. So the immigration experience is further away from uh, what feels personal. Um, for, for years, we have assumed, when I say we, I mean political scientists and pollsters have assumed that it's immigration, the thing that will mobilize Latinos. I think we have, in part, played a role in creating this narrative, we political scientists, in creating this narrative that it is immigration that's going to mobilize Latinos. Uh, and we are seeing for many years now a clear trend, and some of the polling that we've been doing through uh, Univision clearly shows this, is that that's no longer the priority. And it's not longer a priority because uh, ultimately what matters is what you live day to day. You have to feed your family, you have to educate your children. Those issues matter for Latinos, just like it matter for anyone else. But that experience of Latinos and sort of the struggles of the, of the, of the immigrant generation um, it's less of a of, of, uh, direct um, link to the uh, higher percentage of Latinos. So, you know, uh, political scientists have found that the further removed you are from this experience, the, the further it will affect you. It's still there. People still will think in those terms. You still think of terms of I'm Latino, I'm, this is my heritage, right? But the way that you think and prioritize, more importantly, the way that you prioritize immigration uh, will be further away. And, and really the day to day will become um, uh, your priorities. So what that does to Latinos and what that does to a big now an important chair of the voting bloc is that they might look like other voters, non-Hispanic voters. And thinking that immigration will continue to be forever uh, the issue that they'll care the most about, it's in a way a racialized assumption. Specifically about immigration, um, I like this point from, uh, from one of the sort of experts I spoke to on immigration. Hispanics in our region are truly split on this. Many want to be part of the movement to clamp down and shut down the border. They've been exposed to enough messages about the border being out of control, but they also do not want to be associated with what they consider to be uh, law-breaking and those that do not want to wait in line and opt to cross illegally. Um, but other Hispanics see their relatives and their own past mm. and know that the issue is a lot more complex and thus will not vote strictly on this issue. Fair point. Yes, I agree with both of you. What both of you have said um, on immigration, even with Democratic voters, a lot mm -hmm. of them, a lot of Latino Democratic voters sit, want immigration to be legal, right? And um, and whether those narratives are, are fair or not, this whole notion of, you know, do it the right way, uh, people subscribe to that very much. There's a kind of, very kind of law abiding and, and a sense of, yeah, also a sense of immigrants should be able to come legally, but without knowing how difficult that's become. And so you will find, I would say that like, possibly even a majority of Democratic Latino voters they they are they're not just going to say we, everybody should come in, right? They they have subscribed to these ideas that it should happen lawfully, legally, in some kind of orderly way. Um, and then, but then I find Republicans um, that are very sympathetic to immigration, and 
especially the Trump voters in the Valley, I find them to be kind of more ideal, ideologically mixed. And like I spoke with someone who said, if the Democrats had done something for immigrants to make them legal or to just make the situation better, I would have stayed with the party. But they just courted us and courted us. They never did anything. Uh, she, if some of you speak Spanish, I love the saying she said. She said, nos dicen que nos quieren y que pero no se casan con nosotros. <laughs> uh, they tell us they, they love us, they love us, but they never will marry us. And then, so then now she's actually responding to these arguments about border control. And you might think that's kind of in, in conflict, right? But, but the sense is just like, do something about this issue. And I do think that what is specific to the Valley is people are in those communities where these things are playing out. And so some of it is they are responding to those broad narratives. There was a time in the Valley where Democrat, Republicans alike were against a border wall. And after that got politicized more strongly under Trump, now you do find people down there that are in support of the wall. Um, the next subject I'd like to um, ask you about, Cecilia, something close to your heart, the Trump train. <laughs> something you studied, something yes. you studied for sure. So the Trump train was, this, I spoke to a Republican activist who said that's where it all started for him. It started out with eight people. By the time uh, the election came around, there were 5,000 people involved in these, this huge caravan, many of them in different cities. And, um, and uh, that Republican liked the fact that... Um, uh, I asked, is it, is it still there? Is that, will, that, will that still be there in, in the next election with Trump not, not on the ticket? And he said, yes, because everyone were angered that all the um, policies of Trump have been reversed by Biden, so, so we're still active. But, and then, so I asked a Democrat on this, and he said, the influence of Trump is still there, like the sound effect of rumble of lightning in the sky that continues for a few seconds, like a charismatic leader he gave license to people to say out loud and act on attitudes that are not tolerated by the official Democratic platform. The Democrats abandoned those key issues in their official platform and did not allow for any gray areas. I'm referring to the following issues, support for the police, access to guns for personal security, but not military weapons, treating abortion as a moral issue rather than a health issue, harsh sentiments against immigrants due to our the sour national economy and the epidemic of hate crimes in the US. The, um, contrasting views there from a, a, a Republican and a Democrat, but the, the Trump polling you did, to, yeah. tell us about that. I'm a cultural anthropologist, so like that's the stuff that excites me is to see how people live something, how they experience it on the ground, right? Uh, not just their views, but um, that was really interesting to talk to people about how they felt participating in those events. And if you look at the two regions of the country where Latinos shifted the, more, the most towards Trump, um, Florida and, and Texas, South Texas in particular, both places had these very public caravans. And then nationally, you saw some, some trending to the right in other locations. But the areas that had these public events that seemed to also like create a lot of momentum. But what was interesting to me about the way people spoke about those events is there was a sense of belonging mm. and there was a sense of voice and empowerment. And in our study statewide of Latino voters as a whole, those are two things that they typically, a lot of them don't feel. They don't feel they belong in different ways in the country or in the political system where they're not being seen. Another thing is they don't feel empowered and they don't feel like their voice is, is, is considered not just by elected officials, but kind of at multiple levels socially as well as politically. And so what people were experiencing there, I think, was a kind of a self-empowerment. It felt very grassroots. They started the, the Trump trains in South Texas. Were, it wasn't the Republican Party coming in and organizing those things. Folks have this origin story of how it started, and they went and they bought the flags, and they got their friends to come. And before you knew it, it was thousands of people. And they talk about how there were people there of all stripes, and, and everybody was very nice to everybody. You know, we don't expect that from what you see in the media. And so I think, you know, that's what we can take from that. And there were also like strong expressions of cultural identity in those, in those Trump trains in the Valley. It was like you see some people with Tejano and 
proud. And then in, in Florida, people were playing salsa music. So this, I think that's another erroneous narrative that folks down there voted right for Trump because they identify as white. Um, we, can, we should also talk about that, where race comes into this and how people make sense of it. But I just think there were like these massive public events that emerged from the ground and people experience political engagement in a very different way than they typically have been engaged down there. And, and, and I think one of the key things that you're saying is sort of, uh, well, one, that sense of belonging and then uh, sort of uh, how that makes them feel and, and as opposed to sort of whiteness. I think one key aspect and one of the things that we've been uh, observing is um, the way that uh, what belongs means for Latinos, sort of, and is it, and, and what gives them a sense of identity and identification to being American, right? Uh, part of that is also that feeling of respect for law and order and, and, and respect for certain values that they um, want to feel uh, that they're part of and that feeling of uh, being more American. I think they get that with joining these groups, but, but that's always um, colored by a, a Latino Flavor, if, right? Uh, even even today, we see some of the campaigns, um, you know, using this very traditional Republican platform. But then, you know, there's um, Selena music in the in the rallies, and there's like there's a. I think what we're going to be seeing is now the Latinization of the of of both parties. But then, who asked them to join the party? That's really the question. And I think what we're seeing is we're hearing reports of. Uh, Republican Party putting in more money in, in certain districts. Certainly 15 um, is one of the districts where they're, they're paying a lot of attention and Democrats seem to actually move away from investing in these uh, parties, in these uh, uh, districts. So Latinos will respond to that. And, and so for polling shows that um, once they're reached out uh, to uh, vote for whatever party, they create a stronger bone, a stronger bond with that party. Uh, and if they're not being reached out to, if they're not being invited to the party, um, uh, pun intended, um, they might not join, <laughs> right? And so uh, I, I think that's one of the narratives that's gonna come out of the election is, well, uh, Latinos are becoming more and more conservative, and that might be true because of these demographic changes that we are talking about, but also, um, they're finding uh, that they've been forgotten by the Democratic Party. We've been asking this question in our polling. Uh, do you think the Democrats are care about Latinos, they don't care much, or they're hostile? And then same thing with uh, Republicans. And we are finding a declining attachment to the uh, Democratic Party and then growing sort of they're forgetting about us. And, and Republicans sort of split half and they, they don't care, they're hostile. And so really what uh, most Latinos um, are finding is that they really don't find a home, uh, they don't find a party to join. Right? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned District 15 there, yeah. so, and, and the influence of what we call the dark money. Um, it's, it's rather pronounced now, and so whatever results come in on election day, to some extent, it could be skewed by just how much negative advertising there's been, particularly in a district like 15 where it's totally one-sided. Either side of 15 in 34 and 28 um, is pretty even. I mean, the, Vicente Gonzalez, Henry Cuellar have been able to, to get super PACs on the Democratic side to support them. That hasn't happened in, in 15. And um, I think it's now up to $7 million, which the Rio Grande Valley has never seen before. We've never had this much interest. Um, so um, that could, you know, that could skew things. I mean, I speak to a lot of the Democrats down there and they, they're just pumped up. They're riled, they're, they're angry with the Democratic, the DCCC, the, the congressional campaign for not, not investing in Vallejo and not putting out the negative acts against Monica de la Cruz. And they say they're not, they've got the infrastructure, obviously, if, if it's been a democratic area for decades, a democratic infrastructure's there. And so they think that's gonna be sufficient, that ground game will be sufficient. So I think it's still very, very even, 15, okay. but um, uh, there's no, if you watch TV or cable or, um, on the internet and the mailers, 
I don't even live in 15 and I get one a day <laughs> in the mail uh, for, for, for Monica de la Cruz. But um, all, we talked yesterday in the preview, preparing for this, about the, that documentary uh, for, which focused on Myra Flores in District 34. And I wanted to ask about that, the influence of the evangelical churches um, there. You know, the pastor basically um, found her and, and sort of... Um, educated her and, and is her campaign manager. Yeah. Your thoughts on that one? It aired on MSNBC. Well, um, the, the Dicker way thing is that um, uh, there's, there's, there's a project, right? There's a project beyond just, uh, just in the, 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 the person. There's a building up of uh, these profiles with sort of people who have potential. And that's happening uh, across the country. But it's it's probably one of the first time that the um, this um, the evangelical uh, church as it is in 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 their political arm uh, invest in in a Latina in the way that they're doing right now, and so it's it's telling because it's in this it's in in Texas it's in the Rio Grande Valley, but um but the takeaway is that the the investment of the attention paid to to building someone who can eventually run is what's standing out. I'm, I'm, I'm less, you know, interested in sort of uh, the type of politics that the chess is. What we can take away, which is um, the narrative and sort of the, 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 po the politics of each party was built without Latinos in, in the conversation. And so Latinos don't necessarily find uh, a place in either party. And it's time that someone pays attention and sort of pulls Latinos into the conversation of the role that they're going to play. We're about, you know, to hit 20% of the population in areas like the Rio Grande Valley, it's uh, well over 30%, right? Certain places is 80%. And so it was about time that someone paid attention. Is everyone surprised? Because is the Republican Party doing this? Well, uh, yeah, it might be surprising, but the takeaway is not so much whether Latinos have the capacity to hold uh, Republican values, but it's that if, if the, the evangelical church look at this as a project and it so happened to be a Latina. And so that's a takeaway, I think. Uh, it's interesting to me being from the Valley to go back and see the difference, especially in what we call the Upper Valley, but the McAllen, Edinburgh area, where you do see visibly a uh, stronger presence than when we were growing up of, of these churches. And um, even like on street corners with signs and things like that. And that's where I, I make a kind of parallel with the Trump trains in the sense of the sense of creating a voice and creating presence um, and connecting that with political agency in a way that the Catholic Church, um, some part, some portion of the Catholic Church did traditionally around, um, you know, especially like activists in the colonias where the church was also a partner. But as a whole, the Catholic Church doesn't do that, right? And I do see that pretty strongly in that upper, in Hidalgo County. Um, but more broadly on the issue of um, religion and social conservatism, another too simple narrative that circulated is that Latinos are naturally uh, Republican because they are religious and socially conservative. And I would say that um, when we interviewed voters, uh, that tie between religion and political affiliation was stronger for evangelical uh, churches and sort of non-denominational Christian. Uh, less so with Catholics, there's kind of more flexibility. Some vote based on their um, you know, anti-abortion stance and some are can differentiate between some religious view and some political views. And, and then there's plenty of people that are kind of very socially progressive these days and might even be like economically, financially more conservative. Um, so I don't think that we can rely on that simple statement anymore. And uh, another aspect of the uh, 2020 presidential election that was really pronounced in South Texas we spoke about this, previewing this, is the, the uh, energy issue where um, Biden in the, one of the presidential debates says, we just got to go away from fossil fuels. And he didn't know just how important that is to Star County or Sabata County. And when Star County goes for Trump, a so heavily, heavily Democratic area, 
And now the Republican super PACs are investing heavily in that county, thinking that they can they pay a whole slew of candidates in every position, yeah. you know, from the lowest to 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 the to you know to the county judge. They're all, they've got their, it's competitive. This there's, there are races. They've never been races before, but but people thought, well, they're going to take our jobs away if if uh, Biden wins. We're not going to. There's not going to be an oil and gas industry, and so that was a particular. Um, aspect of that 2020, which may have skewed things. Yeah. But what's, inter what's interesting about that is that it's not necessarily a political reaction to it. It's not an ideological reaction no. to it. It's again, it's, it's uh, pocketbook. Yeah, pocketbook. It's, yeah, it's jobs. And so yeah. uh, we might think uh, from from our you know um, uh, 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 academic uh, points of view and sort of the uh, um, lead sort of discourse that that's purely ideological is not. It's it's the day-to-day -day politics and people don't necessarily think about these things um, the way that, that um, we political scientists and pollsters think about it. They, they react to what they see on the day-to-day. -day. And so is, is, is a democratic candidate taking away their jobs? It's not that. It's someone taking their jobs, period. Period. Mm -hmm. Period. And who's promising to bring it back? Some other candidate, right? And so, uh, and and this sort of goes back to that initial conversation about uh, party affiliation, which uh, I think it's there because it was sort of a default. Uh, but as 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 issues become more complex, mm -hmm. and 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 the sorting of the two parties again was built without our voices in 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 the mix. It doesn't necessarily match one or another, and so we shouldn't really be that surprised that Latinos. We shouldn't be surprised if Latinos in 15 years change back to one or the other or, or revert back to mostly being Democratic mm -hmm. uh, because um, there still hasn't been that match and, and we don't have it. And again, I, I, I point back to uh, Bernie Sanders being the preferred candidate for, for, for Latinos. And this, this might seem too extremes. And I think in the minds of the day-to-day -day Latino, they're not extreme because if you ask them, do you want jobs? Yes, I want jobs. Do you want to work in the oil company, yeah, in an uh, oil industry? Yes. Do you want healthcare? Yes. Who gives me those two? I think Trump. I think Sanders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Congressman Quay said I could use this. Um, yeah, he's getting funding from the super PACs, and so is Vicente Gonzalez in 34. And as, as we've said, Michelle Vallejo is getting nothing. He said, well, the um, progressives on the East Coast they funded my opponent in the primary. Lots and lots of money spent on on his primary opponent, and uh, you know that Elizabeth Warren, Bernie, a whole slew of them were helping her. And obviously, Quayle was getting funding from the establishment, Pelosi, etc. But he said, "Why can't Michelle's got not, not getting any money? Why? Why? Where are they? Where? Where is Elizabeth Warren and Bernie? They, they could be f putting all the money in to, to help her when she she can't cope. But I'd like to go back to an issue we've sort of touched upon it: the the lack of political discussions. That in my reporting, I don't see the House meetings. I don't see the town hall meetings. In some, the some of the biggest turnouts uh, in the uh, in the elections are the very very small cities where. You know, you're running for school board, or you're, the, there's a race for city government, and that's because they're the biggest employers. I mean, the, the candidates are running, and if they if their slate wins, there's going to be jobs for my fat for the different families. So there's huge turnouts there, but you don't see, um, you just don't see any any discussion in 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 the parties. Particularly, the Democrats have been in power for so long, so I, I tend to look at what they've done over the years and. And it's just a, automatically people vote that way. So there's no no discussion of ideas. I'd like to know where the, the ideas come from. You know, are they in? I know in the colonial groups the the ideas come from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, there are house meetings. There there are. That's how the policies are formed. But at the on the with the political parties, that doesn't seem to be the case in, in the in the valley. And so if you don't have those meetings, um, you know. Where's where's the solidity? If if they, those meetings didn't take place and therefore policies were not hatched in that way, yeah. where is where is that solidity for that party? Uh, 
Well, I mean, I'll say quickly that um, I, I, I do think Latinos are engaged and they're politically engaged. Um, and there, there are many ways that you can engage politically. Um, and it might not always be just electoral. And, and there's always been a barrier sort of for Latinos to engage electorally. Um, but uh, we know there's, there's high interest in, in getting involved. Now, when, um, when you're not being part of the conversation as to, you know, it's hard for Latinos to run, even in districts where it's high percent of uh, Latino. And when you're not, when your district usually, you know, has been uh, journeyman there multiple times, it's also kind of hard, harder to get motivated to vote. Um, but but um, but I think there's interest. There's just not uh, it, it's it, there's not interest from the party towards uh, Latino necessarily on either one. We're seeing that shift. Hopefully now we see uh, uh, interest from both parties uh, grow. But I think Latinos are politically motivated. They just haven't been part of the conversation uh, at the table. In in our interviews statewide, um, we found that even the non-voters. Uh, we're following at least national politics to some degree, especially these days with social media, et cetera. So it wasn't apathy. It was with the non-voters, it was that they, for different reasons, um, they don't feel that their vote is going to make a difference and they're experiencing powerlessness or being lack of belonging in other ways in their lives. And so it, it seems like something that, that is not uh, where their vote will have any effect. And also, voting is a social habit. That's what we keep pushing out through that study. Is just, It's not just a rational choice. It's something where if you haven't been doing it, it doesn't come naturally, right? So a lot of people vote already because we're kind of trained to do it. Um, but in the Valley, I do think that there is a, an exhaustion among voters with establishment politicians. And I think that's why down there, they voted for Bernie Sanders during the primary, and then they also were very sympathetic to Trump. And in fact, there was one of the Trump, one of the major Trump organizers that was telling me that she's like, when I asked her to think about this, she's like, yeah, you know, I would say that Bernie is like the, like our Trump for them, you know? It's someone who's like coming and saying, no, you don't have to believe everything they've been telling you. They don't have your best interests in mind. And there's another way of doing things, right? Yeah. And so I think that's what's what's key is, is um, I do think the Valley, and I'm from there, is kind of a test case of kind of a political dominance gone wrong. Like I said, because they are small towns and because uh, traditionally people have been able to influence voters, like I only need, you know, very few voters to win a local election. And I have a big family name, so I'm going to work that name to get certain families and other people to vote for me. Maybe I'm going to hire a politiquera illegally and get somebody to go out and drive voters to the polls. And so if I keep the electorate small, I, c I can determine who wins this election. Mm -hmm. And they never included voters in conversations. And so I do feel like we heard more of a kind of more cynical cynicism, if you will. I'm cautious to use that word down there than we did in El Paso, San Antonio, Houston, or Dallas. Um, so. I think, uh, I hope that this is a turning point where I think it's good for the Valley to get competitive and it's good for the parties to have to pay attention and it's good to have the, the governor's debate down there. It is a small portion of the population, but I, I do think uh, it shifts the conversations around Latino voters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and a co as a consequence of that, we might find um, candidates actually running in their own party rather yeah. than every, everyone would, would run in the Democratic Party, Republican or Democrat. And then you, the, all the, the big fight is in the primary and then in the general everyone goes to sleep because the races have been decided and yeah. that's no longer the case. But then we could put on top of that another layer is, uh, the, is I'm a soccer fan so I'll say it, I'll describe it as an own goal, the Democrats ability to score own goals. In District 34 First of all, Philemon Vela resigns, didn't need to do that. that. That produces a special election in July when people are not thinking about politics. And the Democratic leadership in Washington decides, well, we're not going to spend any money in that special election because the redistricting will be in play in the, in the November election. That district's been redrawn. It's going to be more Democratic-leaning, more Democratic-friendly, 
that's true. So they just said, yeah, you know, we're not going to support the Democratic candidate. The candidate loses. Suddenly, Myra Flores, the Republican winner, in, now the incumbent, is elevated, which didn't have to happen, one, if Vela had stayed in place, and two, if the Democrats perhaps had got behind their candidate. And so now she can quite rightly go around as the member of Congress, doors open. She's, she's on a level playing field with, with Congressman Gonzalez in terms of their you know, ability to, you know, they're both two, two Congress, members of Congress run against each other. And as a byproduct, because she is a member of Congress, first Republican, first woman, first Mexican born, all that that we've seen, we've heard that. It's, a, it's also helping in 15 with, with the Republicans. It's giving, um, you know, boosting her chances just to be associated with, with her. So there, the Democrats have, you know, brought that upon themselves. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, it's again, a sort of good indicator of, um, how much they, they um, how much parties believe where Latinos stand, right? Is, um, and 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 I I think statewide um, we're getting different signals from Mayor Flores, and uh, our poll, uh, which we will release on on Tuesday, shows that um, uh, is, is not the same story in 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 in, in the st statewide. As it is in in the uh, southern uh, area, um, less popular, and so. But I think we're doing a lot to elevate the narrative, that whether it exists or not. I think are constantly talking about Mara Flores and sort of <laughs> highlighting these things about her. Um, it's sort of elevating the conversation, which it's kind of this cycle, interesting cycle, where um, we're kind of surprised that she, you know, won, but then uh, we keep talking about it. So now. We're elevating the, so I don't know if we're going to distort the idea of really um, uh, where, where she stands, really. Mm. And, so. and perhaps she's been politically savvy as well about things because on the um, abortion issue, she said she is supportive of abortion in cases of incest and rape, which is not the case for a lot of the Republicans. And so that's a Latino flavor type of politics that we're going to see, right? Mm -hmm. Republicanism, in a way. Mm -hmm. And she's advocating for immigration reform immigration and making reform. some immigrants legal, yeah. mm -hmm. which most exactly. Republicans are not right now. Yeah. 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 So I'm being told our time is up for our conversation, and we're going to open it up to the audience. If anyone has any questions, we've got 15, 20 minutes or so. Hi, my name is Steven and I'm a grad student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Thank you for your time and insight today. Uvalde is a small conservative town with similar political stripes to the electoral politics of the RGV. Do you foresee any changing in this election cycle um, in voting trends in the RGV because of what has occurred in Uvalde? I, based on the, our, our, our report, I think there is support for gun control um, and De Valde will have, you know, um, made that, that feeling stronger. I mean, the South Texas is, is, a, is a big area for hunting, so people don't want their, their um, hunting weapons taken away, but, but these uh, assault type weapons, no, I don't think there's support. I don't have the polling for that, but that's my sense. So yeah, I think the Avalde could have an impact statewide, and could could have an impact in the valley. Um, you know, instantly there were prayer vigils across the valley. People are obviously very saddened by what happened there. Um, Avalde is a, a much smaller area, but yeah, you're right about the demographics. Um, thoughts? I mean, I'm, I haven't done any interviews, so I hesitate to say to speak directly to that. Um, I, I do remember like one person I follow on social media who's a big fan of Myra Flores, then when the Uvalde shooting happened was like writing public statements, Myra Flores, what are you gonna do about this? Like, you know, and that's where I said that, that some of these folks are ideologically kind of, uh, you, can, you can't just pin them down uh, one way or another. I, and on the gun issue in general, like I found people on the right, Latinos on the right who were 
by and large open to before Ovalde, open to more a little more regulation, and then you find people on the left who are very supportive of guns, right? Um, I would be surprised if it was the driving issue. I don't, the thing is, is it gonna, with every election, it's like at that moment, which issue ends up becoming first or second for you? Uh, but that's my guess. I mean, it'll make more of a difference on the left, right? But I don't know of enough to galvanize new voters or a much bigger turnout. And, and unfortunately, I don't think we will get um, an answer from polls. Our, our own survey, um, has a, a, a robust oversample, uh, but 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 the key here is what um, Sila just mentioned that um, we might see changes in terms of your position towards uh, gun ownership and gun control. I don't think I don't know if that necessarily is going to translate into uh, partisan voting and 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 partisan affiliation, um, but. I, I do think we're going to see shifts in how people perceive um, uh, gun legislation. Um, I'm not so sure that's going to translate to a political preferences. Mm. Not yet. And ultimately, I, I think most polls won't be able to show any clear distinction. If, you're, if you hear that whatever national poll, and I'm going to say this, if you hear that any national poll shows movement on this particular town for their 100 Latinos that they include in their sample, <laughs> they actually don't know. They're making it up. And, uh, I appreciate an honest poster. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, there's one particular ad that's running down there. It's probably statewide. Very powerful ad from the, one of the parents who lost a child there. there. And um, she comes out as supporting uh, Beto O'Rourke. Mm. But uh, that, that's, um, you know, having, it must be having some impact. Yeah. Uh, because when 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 all these cities pass their resolutions saying we abhor this, you know, and the, and the as I say, the prayer vigils were the very next day or two days, three days later. There was nothing from the city commission when they passed those resolutions <coughs> that asked the legislature to do anything. None of mm -hmm. none of the leadership in the valley said. I think maybe one or two elected officials said something. Well, okay, now is the time for action. Let's have some legislation to address this. It, well, that was that was vacant. There was just nothing, no leadership there at all, one way or the other. Hello, and thank you for being here. Uh, as a Hispanic from a rural county, I've seen kind of a shift in in the party. As mm -hmm. I, as I grew up, my father would always say, you know, Mijo, the the Democrats were for us. That's that's who they're for. But I don't see the language of Democrat and Republican anymore. I see conservative and liberal, mm -hmm. and liberal almost being a, used as a slur almost as my age and and. and the people in my demographic. Is that something you have noticed overall and that liberals have not been seen as the hardworking party anymore, the blue collar party anymore, as we've seen billionaire tech look into being liberal? Has that taken away from you know, Mexicanos' hardworking ability and what, what they see in themselves? Thank you. What county is that that you're talking about? Where are you from? Bastrop. Bastrop. So I'm, I want to say that this is exactly what we're talking about, right? It's it's the that feeling of one. Uh, there's so many things that you say that I almost want to do. There's going to be a recording, so I'll go back and take notes of every single thing that you say. <laughs> I, I talk about this in my class too, right? So the the how how Latinos see themselves in Texas, right? The hardworking Americano, respectful of things. Right, that's the, the identity that we like to attach to. And does that align with any political party? I mean, it's up, up for debate which one it aligns with, right? So, mm. and, and, and I think you're, you're thinking that it aligns more with the Republican Party now, that narrative, it might, it might very well be true. Because it might also be the narrative that many across the country see, right? That is that the Republican Party is the party for the working class and, the, and we might debate on that. Right. I might see it differently, but but you're not alone. And I think that's the, the key point, is that many across the country see that shift and that the elite now is the, is the Democratic Party and that he has forgotten, you know, uh, the working class party. And that 
And that's the reason why the candidate had to be Biden, because it was Biden who would be able to align with working class uh, in, you know, Pennsylvania and certain states that were important. And so I, I think the Democratic Party has ways to go to convince Latinos that the working class Latino, because often when we talk about and I guess at the national level, when we talk about the working class, we almost mean white, as if Latinos weren't working class too. <laughs> and so I think what we need is a conversation about what it means to be working class and being Latino. I love that. I love both of, of y'all's comments. That was a very astute observation on your part, and, and it gets me thinking. And I do think, um, you know, on the right, the Republicans are very, very good at narrative. That's what they're very good at, right? And so there is a kind of liberal is a bad thing right now, and that's, and that's spreading. And then liberal is a term when we ask Latinos, what does it mean to you? Are you liberal or conservative? Or, or do you identify with those terms at all? And what do they mean to you? Liberal has always kind of had like a vague definition for Latinos, you know, and some of them, if they're Spanish speakers, they identify it with being liberal, like you're too socially liberal, and that's not a good thing. And so to begin with, I don't think the term really resonates with people on the ground. And then on top of that, it's being um, kind of vilified, right? Uh, but I, but then more broadly, I do think that those notions of the parties are shifting. And so um, the vote for Democrats among working class Latinos was predicated on them seeing themselves as working class, which there's a question of whether people want to see themselves that way or not, even if they are yeah. working class. There's a lot of resistance to that. Like, they don't see themselves as, oh, I'm poor and someone's supposed to help me, right? right. And the other thing was race, that before it's this notion of if you're anything but white, the Democrats are the only ones who care about you. And people talk down there about how, like Trump managed to kind of shift the definition of the Republican Party for people. And folks will say in the Valley, it's not Bastrop, but they'll say, when I grew up, I was told that Republicans were white, wealthy people and Democrats were for the little guy. And, and now the definition of both parties in their minds has changed. I think she had a question as well. Uh, so I'm uh, from I'm from the, the Upper Valley myself. Uh, we've had a couple of years of uh, major disruption to the traditional campaign methods, uh, and I was wondering whether you all have the sense that politiqueras are still playing the same role that they used to play, kind of in the '90s and the 2000s, or if there's been kind of a change, especially since um, since COVID has hit. Do you have thoughts on that, Yeah. Um, so the, the, the Democrats will argue that that's why they suffered as well in 2020. They did not go knocking on doors. Republicans did. And because Democrats were more respectful of whatever health and regulations were going on. And they put that, they, they say that was a reason they underperformed. What about now? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, they don't have an excuse this time. That's what they said then. No, let, we, we will wait. We'll have to. We'll have to see. But also, there's been legislation changing the way uh, the politicaras, the the election workers, can um, help voters with their mail-in ballots, etc. So that's um, that's lessened um, the amount of uh, involvement they can have, um, and so. And obviously, we've lost La Palanca. The, you can't vote straight ticket anymore. That's a big, a big deal for, for Democrats, I think. So, but um, they're still, they still there. They still work, um, but their opportunities to help the elderly, you know, drive them, drive them to the polling locations, help them go in. And then now that we have new laws on, on you know, what the election, election judges can do. Um, you know, and this this rules there, laws there now. You can video everything and f film it. Uh, we're waiting to see what what impact that has. For those of you who are not familiar, politiqueras are a very very regional thing, very specific, and they're women who get hired, typically women, um, who get hired to get out the vote, but to get out the vote for a particular candidate. And so there are complaints also about sometimes the legality of it, or they'll just like fill up vans with people from nursing homes and bring them out to to get the candidate to win. But they do play this role of getting out the vote in, in different ways. Like, I regret that I always wanted to do like an anthropological study or write about it for Texas Monthly, and I never did. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating phenomenon down there. 
It's also women at the center of like politics, right? Which is really interesting. Hi, I'm a second year grad student at WJ School and I'm from Houston. But I had a question about incrementalism with what's happening with the Republican Party, where they're in it for the long game, and I can see it happening now in the RGB. Is that what is that's what they're doing? Like the same thing they're doing with Roe versus Wade, where they're in it for the long run, 50 years, whatever it takes. I didn't hear the first. Oh, yeah. So, incrementalism. So a long, a long, uh, it's a long-term strategy with what? So starting now, like just plotting as far as like starting with little candidates, putting uh, the money in, investing in this community. I have I've, I've no idea what internal conversations the Republican Party <laughs> might be having. But it, 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 if it is, um, it, it's, it seems like they it fell on their, they, they didn't know, I think. My sense, uninformed sense, is that it fell on them, right? I don't think they, they, they knew how much they could do until it happened. Um, and, and, but, and then now I think they're seeing the, the potential, and I, I think they're gonna, we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, our poll has shown that they are reaching out. And this anecdote that I'm hearing sort of um, uh, confirms that they're reaching out much more. So I, I don't see any reason why they will stop promoting candidates, one, and two, continue to reach out. Uh, ultimately, all I want uh, sort of, uh, and I hope my research sort of chose, is to highlight the importance of uh, Latinos taking seriously. And it seems like, at least in the Valley, uh, the one party that's taking Latinos seriously uh, is the Republican Party. And so I, I don't see that stopping. I, I, I can see how that might get translated to other uh, political markets. There has been a presence in the Valley of like the Koch brothers have been there for a while and they create these centers, kind of community centers that also help people with other things. And so I would say at that level that it has been a long-term strategy. I don't know at the level of the party. I, I agree with Sergio that the party responded to an opportunity that they suddenly saw, right? But, but there has been money going in down there. Um, yes, I had a, thank you. Um, yes, I had a question. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Really have, love having these conversations. Um, so we've seen a recent and open shift of political alignment. And um, we've seen so with uh, Congresswoman Myra Flores. Um, so she was like using the saying of like, quote unquote, pro God in her in her uh, commercials and campaigning. I just wanted to know if do you guys think this shift of like pro God, quote unquote, would be, um, I guess, like a tool that Democrats would shift towards. Because um, just like back home, I'm from the Rio Grande Valley, and um, that was like solely the only thing that people voted for. Um, Myra Flores was over Dan Sanchez, of course, um, was um, the pro God statement. So uh, I. Want to go, I almost want to go back to um, that conversation about the Latino flavored uh, Republican, right? And, in, you know, Cue uh, Cuellar is um, uh, pro abortion, right? And he's a Democratic candidate. And so, uh, you know, politicians adapt and they win because they adapt it, right? And so, um, I. I think there's a lot to learn uh, from these uh, campaigns and others will see it. I think it's hopefully these forums bring uh, the type of conversation to the forefront that it's not, it's not as simple as saying Latinos are becoming more Republican is more to say is this candidates who have understood the dynamic and we've been seeing it for years. Again, Cuellar is a different type of Democrat, right? And so uh, it's what Latinos want and ultimately uh, what whatever candidate is able to sell that is the candidate that will win. So, uh, yeah, that's a strategy, and others will most likely will follow. Uh, I think to uh, the earlier point, at the fantastic uh, uh, point about um, Trump being able to change the narrative. Um, I think there was an appetite for that, and sort of Trump maybe even bump into this uh, strategy. I don't know how uh, uh, 
well thought out it was from the beginning, but just found this niche and exploited it. And I think now, you know, Trumpism will survive without Trump. So um, I, I, I think, yeah, people will continue to emulate whatever works. What I would add to that quickly is that I'm not a political strategist by any means. I study human behavior. But um, I know, like in talking to Vicente Gonzalez, he felt that um, sort of the national, uh, not the platform, but the national narratives that the De Democratic Party created weren't helpful to him with his particular constituency, right? So I think it's also about how local, people running at these local levels, I mean, he's the national elected official, is how do you underscore, how do you just explain, focus on different positions of the party that do resonate with those voters, mm -hmm. right? But instead they're working with this kind of one way of talking about what the Democratic Party stands for that's very dominant through media, through national politics, and, and they need to be able to adjust for their own voters and constituents. Um, if, if we're ending now, I, I'd like to just say that I found a way of bringing LBJ into the conversation as we're, <laughs> as we're at the Presidential Library, but I can't take credit. It's really um, a retired professor from UT, Pan American, Gary Mounts, politics professor. <clears throat> he said, um, point out that um, it was President Johnson, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who taught in South Texas, as we know, his legacy includes the war on poverty, civil rights, voting rights, and um, he passed uh, Medicare. Medicare. And, and, and I mention all that because, because in South Texas, in the Valley, there's, there's no, the, the Democrats and the Republicans have not fought on the issues because it's been a, a, a sort of one-party rule. Democrats have never had to... Um, make the, their case, it's, there's been other reasons, family ties, you know, uh, uh, sort of other reasons why, why you vote a certain way. They've never had to explain their position. So they've never championed, they've never said, this is our legacy as a party and, and, and locally today. They don't say that they have been in power all these years and, and the valley is growing fast. We're, we're, the interstate is being developed. We've got a, um, a regional university. We've got international trade with a gateway to America. And those things didn't just happen. We didn't get the funding for our, as Luis knows very well, we didn't get the funding for our universities uh, because people wanted to help South Texas and the border region. Awesome. Elected officials working with the civil rights groups had to fight through the courts to get it. And we don't hear any, any, any of that. And so uh, when the Democrats don't even tell the voters their, who they, what they represent, you know, that's shame on them. But that's, that's what's happened. But that's because we haven't had to have any discourse. Maybe it'll change now. They need to tell their story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, bring our, bring our voices. And sort of, again, like I said, I. I all, all I want is for Latinos to be taken seriously. And, uh, and I think it's coming from an unexpected source, but I think the attention is here. And you know, these this forums definitely are um, uh, an example of how we need to have these conversations and hopefully we get to have them at the national level too. So. <laughs> So thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. If you are not yet a member of the Future Forum, I encourage you to sign up on our website, lbjfutureforum.org, or come visit with us after. Members enjoy first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Library. Upcoming events include an Austin Mayoral Forum on October 28th at noon next week in this same space. Also on November 16th at noon, we will host a virtual event examining the Supreme Court in light of recent major decisions. Right across the plaza, the LBJ School will be an early voting location starting October 24th through November 4th and will serve as an official voting location on election day, November 8th. Parking is available in lot 38, the LBJ library parking lot, and the hours are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I wanna give a thank you to today's event organizers, Lauren Sprain and Luis Figueroa. Thank you. As well as Sarah McCracken and the entire LBJ Future Forum Board. 
thank you again to today's speakers. And finally, thank you to our audience for engaging on today's most important policy matters. I hope to see you all again soon.